All right, today I am joined by two special guests. I have Chris Hartvigson, the CEO and founder of Dooley, and longtime listener, first time guest, CEO and co founder of Clue, Jason Smith. Thank you so much for joining me, you two. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'm very excited to be interviewed by the one and the only Adam McQueen, who I've heard a lot about. Very excited cut. about this show. Ben, producer Ben in the background, cut that clip, run it on loop. I need, we, need to, we need to save that one on file. Okay, but the real reason we have you two on today and why I'm so excited and honored that you've given up your time is... As two business leaders, I want your perspective on how to navigate these uncertain and frankly, more competitive markets that we're in today. So Chris and Jason, you're both talking with plenty of CEOs, founders. What are each of you seeing broadly across businesses in terms of how, and I hate to use this word, Chris, you, you, you laughed at it offline how economic headwinds are impacting pipeline and revenue today. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to take the first stab at this one. Um, so there's there's an obvious reality. I, I think that the, the funny part about this is Jason and I are old. Um, and as old grizzled people, we've actually been through a few of these uh, economic bumps. And so when you see it, you know what it looks like a little bit differently the second or third time around. Uh, from my perspective, the things that are changing are that people are a little bit more careful with which calls that they're going to take uh, because they're feeling pressure on their side. Uh, we at Dooley, we sell sales technology, so we're selling into the people that are selling. So we sort of see what's going on quite quickly in the marketplace. How we call us the tip of the spear uh, from a technology perspective in terms of like what you might be evaluating to cut or not cut first uh, or what you might be evaluating to add or not add first. Um, and so what we're seeing is, you know, close rates are a little tighter across our customer base. We're seeing uh, opportunities stretch a little bit longer than they were before, which means that you're probably needing more to keep the deal energized and al moving along, uh, more excuses to talk to the customer in between calls. Um, and, and we're certainly seeing, you know, people, uh, you know, trying to condense their, their spend a little bit as well. So, you know, when, when people see, you know, what happened a year ago versus today, the big difference is a year ago, funding was a frenzy and everybody was cashed up. And so it was like, hey, mom, can I have some allowance? Yeah, have as much as you want, buy as many things as you want. Uh, and then this year, you know, the price of bread just went up and everybody's going, well, wait a second, uh, maybe, maybe not as much allowance because we can't afford food for the table. So, you know, people are certainly being more cautious and careful with what they're, um, what they're spending money on. Jason, is that sort of in line with what you're experiencing and seeing as well? Yeah, there's no question. It's tightening. Why we're seeing um, we're seeing clients and customers and prospects all just revisit budgets across the board. So there's from CFO down saying, "Do we need it?" And that's for existing clients. And then for any new spend, where before in a land of plenty, you could go with something innovative and talk to a senior person, and they would say, "Let's give this a spin." Now I think the give this a spin is not happening and there needs to be clear ROI. There needs to be a much closer proof point to how this is going to generate revenue or save costs. And so I think the narrative has changed for a lot of companies to be much more ROI focused to help sell their products in. Um, we get a ton of inbound requests for people to sell software to Clue, and I'm sure Chris gets it for Dooley. Never happened. And, <laughs> and, and a lot of those emails have shifted from, I've got this cool thing to, I can save you money, or this is how I can make you money, and there's more percentage proof points there. So I think that's one of the shifts that I've seen. The other shifts are, as a result of you know fewer um, budgets opening up, opportunities are fewer and far between. So the remaining opportunities in the pipeline are significantly more competitive, right? Your competitor's just as hungry as you are. So it's, it's much more aggressive. So you're seeing price competition, you're seeing specials being awarded, you're seeing certainly your vulnerable competitors go really aggressive. Um, so I think those things are just making it more difficult for salespeople to sell. 
feels yeah there's it, it sparks more volatility too in terms of what other players in the market are doing i think it speaks to this i'm going to plagiarize this uh this quote but in good times deals are done on the back of napkins but on in harder times they're done with excel sheets um what what becomes most critical then in terms of you're trying to meet expectations but you've got less at your disposal internally and like you're mentioning externally in the pipeline like chris from your your take right now what are some of the most critical things you need to focus on so one of the things i think we both admitted in in talking about the, you know the tightening economy is that uh, the purse strings uh, at the various levels within the organization also shift right so mm. Uh, what used to be a sales manager might be a director of sales. What used to be, you know, some, some a junior finance person is now the the, the CFO, right? Um, and, and so you need to be able to talk a slightly different story when you're talking to those people. They have different value drivers for themselves. Uh, so certainly that's a bit of a shift that we're seeing as well. But in terms of um, conversation points and what you're talking uh, around, I think you, you you really need to understand your your buyer a lot better. You know, maybe be a bit more researched. Uh, understand the pains and challenges. And and also, given that you know there's going to be a little bit more heat in all of those deals, you know, there's more people chasing less pie, uh, you probably need to understand how to lay the right landmines, if you will, you know, old, old school, uh, Chris here using old school words, um, but uh, try to lay the right landmines in, in place so that as your competitor, you know, enters in there, they uh, they maybe trip over some of those things. Uh, first of all, it's a defense mechanism for you to be able to, to say, okay, you know, if, if our competitor comes into the deal, they're probably going to do this, or they're probably going to do this. And you want to say that in a way that I think is is more respectful than than how I'm articulating it right now. Uh, but certainly, you want to make sure that they're aware that you've kind of done your homework on other options that they may be going with. Um, and then uh, I would say the the other side of that is really ensuring that you are able to talk up the things where you know you've got competitive advantage. Yeah, my take on that is there's two things. Like there's two, like you've got uh, um, this two-tiered approach where before you could sell to somebody internally and they could go have that conversation with whoever they needed to inside their company. And it could be maybe not as crisp. Um, hey, I want to do this and there's these other things. And, you know, the person was a little easier on aligning up the budget for them. And now, you know, those people are coming back going, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And there's five questions that they get answered, 10 questions that they get answered. They're getting hammered. And so you really, as a seller, need to be able to articulate your value prop very clearly, differentiate it very clearly, so that that person that you've sold it to internally can sell it internally to their folks. And so there's, it's multi-tier selling that's happening internally without you there. You can't influence it. So how much are they retaining? That's one. The second thing is just picking up on Chris's point. I think what we're seeing is competitors are kind of moving really quickly to adjust to whether it's recession era messaging, but also pricing and new things that they're offering, whether it's partnerships and kind of combined offerings. There's a lot of changes. And so you got to, one, you got to know what those things are. Um, so that you're not surprised. And two, you've got to figure out how to navigate around them. And so that's equipping those folks with the right information so that they can outmaneuver in those times when a competitor is going to get way more aggressive now with those remaining pipeline opportunities. Yeah, the nimbleness with which your your competitor's messaging is going to change is significant. The, the nimbleness with which the market is going to change around you is unbelievable. To a lot of people, you know, uh, when uh, if we talk from a CEO's level, when we talk to our investors in our portfolio to try to get a sense of like what's the temperature in the room, like what are you seeing out there, you know, the the story has changed significantly from, you know, let's let's aggressively play offense right now um, and and grow the business to uh, let's be really mindful of burn multiples. So equally, like as you look at websites and as you look at the messaging that's happening in our inboxes, etc. All of those things are changing to a different narrative to accommodate where we are in the market and what the economy is doing around us uh, in a way that is making it so the seller has to adjust and has to know how others are adjusting as well. Totally. And I want to zoom in a little bit. I think, Chris, you mentioned there when the pie shrinks, but there's the same amount of players in the space. Ultimately, that's going to make things more competitive. Just how fine are the margins on these wins and losses in deals? Today, and you mentioned in previous economic bumps that you and Jason have witnessed and been a part of. 
Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I think that still depends a lot on a sort of a case by case basis as to how well you solve the problem for your, your customer. Uh, I do think now, uh, as much as you know, we, we think about like how we fare relative to our competition, it's also how well we service our customer in times like this. They have confidence that you're not going anywhere and how, how well you're supported by your team and how well you're supported by your cash flow and all the different things that they might be looking at behind the scenes to understand you. So are the margins tighter? Absolutely, the margins are tighter um, because exactly what Jason was saying, you know, there is every ability for somebody to go, oh, you're up against so-and-so in this deal. Well, I'm going to drop my price by 50%. Uh, and, and it's almost like a reflex and it's a panic maneuver. And it's, frankly, it is a bit of a junior selling maneuver for sure. Um, you know, as you get more tenured in your career, you know that those tactics aren't always the things that are going to take you across the line. But if you're looking at like very baseline table stakes features from one product to the other, and, and it's only the table stakes features that you care about, price is obviously going to come into the equation. Surely, though, I know, you, I think, again, you have this wealth of experience, like you commonly like 50% price drop, like that's a, that's a sign of inexperience or junior selling. It's still a 50% price drop. Like that's, Absolutely. that's, it's not the same as what was happening maybe when you were selling against a competitor a year ago. You no, know, you're absolutely right. And and so, again, that's where you need to have done your homework to understand, you know, what is the first move uh, on the chessboard that you're likely to see from others around you? Um, and how do you get ahead of that such that you don't have to offer the 50 percent price drop? You know, uh, you know, really classic tactic is something like, oh, as soon as so and so hears that we're in this deal, I almost assure you that they're going to drop their price by X. And why are they going to do that? Probably because they're concerned that they know that we do A, B, and C a lot better than them, right? And so you want to be able to weave that into the story in a way that you can get ahead of it so that you don't have to give away all of your value, right? At the same time as 50% price drops are happening, we're seeing 15% increases in our GCP costs and all the other things that are sitting behind the scenes. Salaries are going up. So you have to also be able to service the customer effectively uh, and, and giving away all your value is probably not the right solution understanding how you can differentiate is really important. Yeah. Well, Chris, what you're saying reminds me of Jason, something you shared internally with us at Clue. Uh, it was this post from Chris Orlob, formerly at Gong, right? I was actually just thinking about that exact post. So Gong, you know, Chris put together something that spoke to the value that Gong could provide. You know, if their solution costs 300 K that they're going to deliver, $3.5 million in value and it, in the form of reduced ramp time and how many reps are you going to hire over the next period? And it was a very elegant kind of walk through the math equation to preach to the value of what Gong could deliver. And I thought it was very smart. So I shared it internally. But the second thing is, well, how's that differentiate from course or Zoom recording or other recording technologies now? Is the value of the 300K Gong offer as worth it compared to the 150K Zoom recording offering or the Google Meet offering that's not as mineable, sacrifices some features, but has a differentiated price point. Those are the things that I think you need to look at. Prove the ROI value, and certainly in times of recession, but secondly, differentiate your value from that competitor. That's something that I think is prevalent. Now, there's one other concept, Adam, that I find really compelling. You, you touched on how close is it out there. We've got over 500 clients right now. We see tens of thousands of deals that their sales teams are running through. It is down to the margin, and it has been increasingly so. This is not just a recession thing. This is just you barely lose a bunch of deals you don't lose by like, it's a landslide. It's like a narrow margin that you're losing a lot of these deals. It's head to head with certain competitors and it's just by a hair. And if you do win loss interviews afterwards, it's like, well, we just kind of went with them because of these kind of subtle little things, but it was a real toss up. Those are the most painful ones to lose. And we keep talking about this concept of a competitive revenue gap. What is all the business that you lose to your competitors? There's a chunk of it. And a pile of that is stuff that you probably would have lost anyway. But there's a bunch that are that hair loss, <laughs> that one little bit that you shouldn't have lost, that your your CRO goes nuts for, that your sales some sales reps are losing more than other reps. That's the piece that you want to zero in on and figure out how to tip a handful of those your way. And it can really magnify into a lot of revenue. 
I want to put a, I'm putting you both on the spot here. I want to put a face to the name here where you mentioned the, the neck and neck deals, the 5149, so to speak. Chris, over your career overseeing or being a part of deals, is there one that you can recall that just slipped through the cracks to a competitor? Yeah. And I, I mean, lots. Uh, and I will say this really candidly to everybody who's listening to this in, in your audience base. If you're not losing deals, you're not in enough deals, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a very, very important thing. And if you're not losing to your competitors, you haven't tried to really push the envelope with uh, a lot of things that are going on in the market um, and, and trying to understand how, like, where are my edges? So it's okay to lose. It's not okay to lose when you should have won. And, and so there are ones that you should, you know, kick yourself for afterward. Oftentimes, the ones that you will kick yourselves the most on are the ones where you feel like you got outsold and you get outsold because you have a knowledge gap, typically, or, you know, sometimes it's a relationship or rapport or like an outside factor that you're not really clear on, you know, Jason's friend with friends with so and so, therefore, he's going to buy from so and so instead of buying from me. Um, and, and things like that will happen. Is that in your control? Yeah. I think over the long haul of your career, those things become more in your control, but you still have to build up that rapport and credibility. When you go into a conversation armed with the right knowledge, armed with the right understanding of your customers' requirements and needs, armed with how you are different and how you can you know, convey that difference relative to what your customer is looking to try to accomplish, if you lose those deals, that's where you get probably the most disappointed, but it, you know, in fair place, you're going to lose some of them just because um, it's, it's when you, it, it, when you go into those deals and, and you don't have the answers that you feel the worst, uh, honest, honestly, like, uh, and, and sometimes I think that, you know, as reps, uh, and, and this is going to be another thing you're going to see in the next six, 12, 18 months you're going to see a separation from the really good reps and the ones who have been able to cruise uh, down the street because, you know, at, 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 for the last few years, if you stood under the basket, you were going to get points, right? Uh, and now you actually have to, you know, understand how to, do, how to work your jump shot from way outside the, the three-point line uh, in order to score. So it, it, it is harder to win business right now. Uh, and, and that means really bringing your a game and really being prepared and and that's you know there, there's so many different feeds of intelligence that come into that uh and, and you want to make sure you have them all at your disposal cream kind of rises to the top you also threw in a basketball analogy so you're a man after my heart i jason i saw like a visceral reaction from your end here as chris mentioned some of those moments the disappointment the unprepared like there is some what, what was going through your mind there was a few of those reactions I just caught on camera for, for the listeners. Adam, I'm not going to quantify the competitive revenue gap that we have at Clue, but yeah, for sure we've lost deals that you just, you look at and you go, we absolutely should have won that. And the ones that hurt the most are the ones where you hear that that company tell you afterwards, well, we went for this reason and this reason. And you clearly didn't do a good enough job explaining your value because you do all those things. In fact, you do them better than your competitor. But for some reason, your competitor kind of outplayed you, outspoke you, created a filter that the prospect ended up absorbing their message um, in a way that would trump yours. And those ones hurt, right? Like if you do something really well, you're known for your three-point shot. Adam in basketball and somebody goes, well, I kind of chose that other player because they're a really good three pointer, right? Then you, you, you're, you're, you're frustrated. Why, what do you mean? I'm the great three pointer. So I think that's the, those are the most frustrating ones and they exist and hopefully you can get them back in the future uh, where, you know, the proof comes out and FUD that maybe your competitor laid about them being a better three point shot uh, disappears. Over the 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 longer you're into your career, the further you're into your career, the more you realize when you've been outsold as opposed to getting beat. And there's a really big difference uh, in that. And, and if you're really honest with yourself, you'll know when you've been outsold. It's not the excuse of, oh, we got beat on price. We got beat by this. We got beat by that feature. You know when you've been outsold. Chris, you mentioned, uh, I want to continue. Just last question on this sort of in in the deal. I like your perspective, Chris and Jason, on, on this. You mentioned that now the good sellers, the great sellers are going to be separated from the not so good sellers, the A's and the, the, the D's that get degrees. What is it that separates a really good seller when it comes to selling against competition, selling the value to the customer and those that are going to 
going to feel the pinch now? So I think there's a few things and some of them are really hard to, uh, to train into a person. So personability is, it ha- has a lot to do with whether or not people buy from you, because ultimately, uh, as they say, people do buy from you uh, in the absence of like any sort of competitive gap or anything like that. They're going to buy from the person that they trust and the person that they like. That person is likely the person that came to the, uh, to the table the most prepared and the most empathetic to your challenges and the most understanding of where you sit in the world. Uh, and, and frankly, the, you know, the A players, they just, they, they just practice more. They understand what's going on around them. They, they understand the, the competitive landscape. They understand uh, the positioning and the messaging relative to their customer. It's not generic anymore. The good storytellers, the people that make you feel like you're a part of something, those are the people that you tend to buy from. Um, and, and so I, I've done a, a blog post on this. I call it outside in selling. If you try to sell a product into a company, you're doing it wrong. If you try to sell a company onto a product, that means that you're communicating from their perspective and their point of view uh, and understanding what they are going through. And it's going to make for a more compelling narrative for them to then sell internally because it's like, oh, this person really gets me. You get them again by doing the homework, by doing the repetition, by doing the practice uh, and, and not just walking in blind. It's, it's a fool's errand to think that it's going to be as easy today as it was six months ago. My take, Adam? Are you interested in my take? Yes? Okay. Of course. Yeah. Always, uh, Jason. Yeah, my take on that is, is, I think Chris hit on a very key point, trust. Trust comes from being direct, being honest, being authentic, being saying something in that meeting that they go back and validate with another client that they've met or know or review. So it's like saying something, truth, validation, loop. But it's also, you know, in the preparation and all of the pieces that you do where every time you show up, there's just that one little thing that you go, that person's on it. And um, I believe that the company is going to be on it when that person's on it. So sales is this tip of the spear of how you deal with that company. They view you, that salesperson, as indicative of what they're going to get from the company. So, you know, can I trust them? Can I trust the company? Are they going to put the homework in? Are they going to show up prepared? Are they going to do the work? That's, that's you know, a core kind of subtext on everything. Just the basics. You got to understand the pain and make sure that you're matching up the pain. If it's not the right solution for them, you should walk away and you should tell them that and focus on earning their trust rather than trying to ram something through that is a dollar win. So uh, I think that's what's going to separate the winners is is earning the trust with authentic, genuine fact, and then doing the work and showing up and understanding where your solution fits into their pain. Yeah. Uh, can I just have one last thing? So I think that a lot of sellers say what they think the buyer wants to hear, as opposed to being really honest and, and direct with them. Uh, I'll give you a really good example. We re- uh, just finished a, a fairly big deal for about 1,300 users. Um, in that deal, they mentioned something that they were doing in their process that I fundamentally disagreed with. Uh, and I called them out on it and I said, look, I think that you're going to run into danger here, here, and here. And here's why. And here's where I've seen that before. And they were so grateful because they actually hadn't really looked around that corner yet. Uh, and it just, it layered in credibility and trust. And it, it gave them a sense that, you know, I wasn't just trying to pander to them. I was trying to give them what they, what I thought they needed in a different lens than what I think they had considered before. That's such a great example. Expertise, but it's the de- delivery of that, I'm sure, is is key as well. Like they're both, you can't have one without the other there. Yeah, yeah. Saying you're wrong, you're stupid is probably the wrong approach to that equation. Or just nodding, nodding and waving and just waiting for the, hoping that dollar, those immediate dollars come in that will probably go out the back door through churn in six months time because you just nodded and nodded that, and just sets you up. That. That connects back to something we talked about earlier in the podcast, which is like, does your prospect truly understand what you're offering? You can kind of hand wavy and feel pretty good in a meeting that it kind of, they kind of sort of got it and they walked away. But what do they say when asked, what is that thing? What are we going to buy? If they can't articulate that well internally, you, you didn't do a good job. You wowed them in that meeting and you nodded and you said yes and you were hand wavy. But there's nothing that's stuck. And usually things that stick are maybe something that's an insight that they hadn't considered that you have a degree of expertise in. 
likely you've just been direct and honest about what you can and can't do relative to your competition. And they frame that up, increase the trust, and then can articulate it in a more effective way internally. There's one last thing, Adam, that I wanted to make sure that we hit on when we talk about the competitive side of recessions, and that is your existing client base, not just new business, but when there's a lack of opportunity, your competitors go shopping where there's already budget. If budget's tight in the new world and where it's greenfield, they're going to go where there's budget and they're going to get aggressive with your client base. So make sure that you're sniffing your CS team is sniffing when their competitors are poking around and they're doing it nonstop. Like it, you're probably not selling to your clients, but your competitors are. So make sure that you've got a, a handle on that, particularly in recessionary times when people are searching everywhere for budgets and those budgets exist with your client base. Is that something you're experiencing, Chris? Uh, absolutely. I mean, when we look at churn and if you're not experiencing churn, wow, you're super fortunate, uh, but everybody gets a little bit of churn here and there. Um, when we see churn, if we're losing to competitors, then it's kind of a sham on us moment. If we're losing to, you know, we just had to whack our entire sales team or we had to, you know, cut our budgets by X and, uh, and unfortunately we can't sustain all of our tech stack. That's a different story, right? You're trying to stay as an above the line solution for your, for your customers. Um, you should you should know well in advance because your competitors are probably in there three months, eight months before your renewal is done uh, or, or up. And, and if you're monitoring things behind the scenes like usage metrics, uh, you should be able to get a sense of, OK, wait a second. This customer used to use this product religiously and we're seeing it slip. What's going on? And be able to dig into that and be proactive and preemptive uh, in, in your fight for that stuff. And again, from a, from a competitive stance, if you work really well with your customer post sale, They'll tell you a lot of stuff. Hey, we're, we're, we've been told by RevOps that they're considering switching to blah. We don't want that to happen. How can I help you, right? That's the relationship you want to have. That relationship building piece on pre-sales and post-sales is, is what I'm taking from there. Uh, one final question here. I know we've kind of zoomed in on sort of like net new deals, competitive deals, now on that kind of churn renewal side, but zooming out, putting back on your, your business leader hat here. Both of you have gone through economic bumps in the past. What have you learned about running a business through uncertainty? And how are you using those experiences now to set your business up, the entire business up, to be in a winning position as we navigate? Drink every time Adam says uncertainty, but when you're navigating uncertainty here. I just did a, uh, a session for the, the university I'm an alumna, alumnus from. Uh, last night and they asked me what I'm most optimistic about. And my answer probably came across as a little strange. Uh, my answer is that people are going to understand what hard work looks like. Um, when we, for the last five, six years, it has been a little easier for people to, you know, hit their targets, to hit the milestones. And, and what you're going to realize now is again, that separation of, you know, the, the real, top performers from the ones who have been able to ride on the coattails of a really hot market. So I feel really positive about that because I've seen it before. I've seen what happens when people actually have to roll up their sleeves and be responsible. I think what you're going to see from a business perspective is people operating a lot more responsibly, which means that, you know, somebody like, well, let's take uh, HashiCorp as an example. HashiCorp probably has like 400 pieces of technology across the organization as they go and be more responsible that number might become 300 or 200. So being an above the line solution when people are gonna cull that much of their tech stack means that you are doing the work up front to understand their pains, their problems, their needs, and you understand how you fare relative to the competitive landscape and you understand what it takes to make them perform as an organization and, and, and. So I think what you're going to see as a byproduct of this economic uncertainty, as you put it, is that People will have to be a, a little bit more disciplined in being more relatable and, and really rocking what it is that, that their customers need and where their worries are as well. My take on this is there's, um, it's very company dependent. If you heard from Mark Benioff in a 2008 recessionary Salesforce time, they pulled back and his regret was his business was great. Salesforce was doing well, actually, through that recession. 
they should have tripled down in that recession instead of pulling back. But a different business, you know, perhaps in the financial world, was much more hammered, and they had no choice but to pull back. So I think you have to look at every business with a very unique lens of what's your cash, cash position, what's your burn rate like, when are you going to need to, in the startup land, fund again, or if you're a large company, when you're going to need to look to meet shareholder expectations, externally, public, or internally, private. And I think you're going to figure out how aggressive you can get. I think everybody kind of in a first moment of recessionary whiffs pulls back just to make the train move a little slower because it's hard to reroute it when it's flying. So I think everybody pulls back initially. Now I think we're at this stage of different companies are going to approach it very differently. Some will get more aggressive. Some will pull back. Some will stay frozen. And we're going to see that play out in hiring software purchases, how they move. Um, advertising and marketing is kind of the first variable spend that you can look at. So will that come back? It's pulling back. Will it come back? I think you're going to see different approaches. Like Notion, for instance, just launched an entire advertising campaign and is going aggressively down the advertising path in the face of a recession. They've got a great cash position. They've got momentum. They're going to try and be aggressive in a, in a recession. There's many others that have pulled yeah. back completely. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Uh, from a CI perspective, I think this is a really important piece. When you think about the role that you can play in terms of your contribution to the performance of your business, that's that's a really important thing for, for folks like myself to get our heads around is how well are we positioned relative to our competition uh, in terms of like, when did they last raise? What are they doing? How are they responding to this? Okay, now I understand all of that. I know my relative cash position. I know my relative performance. Should I be stepping on the gas right now or should I be pulling back? And again, that CI slash PMM team can play an instrumental role in the decision process of the executive suite as to what they should be doing. You're going to see other indicators, obviously. Forecast, is it going up or down? How much is it going up or down by? Uh, you know, Churn, all those different things are going to be metrics you're going to be monitoring. But again, knowing your relative position, I think, is really, really important. Let me close, Adam, with my comment on I, product marketers need to be looking at revenue connections. How can they help influence revenue at this point? It's a critical juncture, and the whole company is looking at that. And depending, the higher up you go in the organization, the more your metrics, your bonus, and everything is attached to revenue. Lower down, sometimes that's missed. Sometimes it's my job is this. It's not necessarily to impact revenue. That's sales job. In times of recession, that becomes much more pointed. Everybody needs to be impacting revenue. There's only a certain point where you carve back from an expense. You get to that level. And I think most companies have kind of done that. Now it's about revenue. So looking at any solution that you're bringing in, test that vendor to see how they're going to help you impact revenue. That's a great way to close this conversation. Chris and Jason, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this has been, I've just got, I got a lot of notes. I'm sure the listeners do too. Thank you so much. And we'll catch everyone next week.